Thank you. Thank you all very much. Jeff, thank you for the introduction and to all of you, thank you for the invitation to be here today. And thank you for your patience and endurance. <laughs> Put up with 14 candidates for President of the United States, but the role that you all will play as we move forward both through this primary process and through the process of electing a new Republican President next November will be absolutely vital. So thank you for your willingness to be involved. Uh, this entire campaign changed a few weeks ago. Since I entered this race, I've been talking about the need that the American people have and that the world has for a strong and resolute America. When I initially started to discuss this, it may have seemed somewhat out of step with the issues that were being discussed at the time. And in the first debate in August in Cleveland, I asserted my position directly in a conversation with Senator Paul. The fact is that America today is weaker and less prepared to protect our citizens than we were seven years ago. And I'd like to blame all of this on Barack Obama. But, but we have had Republicans who were complicit in this weakening as well. We've had Republicans who have stood on this stage today and said they were for a strong America, yet voted this summer in Congress to weaken America, voted to take away tools from our intelligence community that permits us to be able to connect the dots and do what President George W. Bush instructed me and the other 93 U.S. attorneys in January of 2002 to do everything we could under the law to make sure that not another American life was lost to a terrorist act on American soil. For seven years we did that and we used those tools directly and constitutionally and the American people remain safe. As we stand here today, for the first time since 9-11, I think we're going to have to confront the loss of American life on American soil to terrorist conduct. Now, there's many people today who are still trying to speculate about what happened in San Bernardino yesterday. Let me tell you as a former prosecutor, from the time I began to watch the events unfold last night, I am convinced that was a terrorist attack. And the President continues to wring his hands and say, we'll see. But those folks dressed in tactical gear with semi-automatic weapons came there to do something. And let's remember something, everybody. If a Center for the Developmentally Disabled in San Bernardino, California, can be a target for a terrorist attack, then every place in America is a target for a terrorist attack. We need to come to grips with the idea that we are in the midst of the next world war. And you see, unlike the other folks who you'll hear from, who you have heard from today and you will hear from going forward, these acts of terrorism are not theoretical to me. They're not something that I've been briefed about by some briefers in the basement of the Capitol. They're not something that I just saw on TV. I was named United States Attorney by President George W. Bush on September 10th, 2001. And the next day, my wife did what she did most days, which was to leave her home at 6 o'clock in the morning to get in her car, drive to the train station, take the train to the PATH station, and take the PATH train into the World Trade Center, where she went up those large escalators and walked through the lobby of the World Trade Center at 7.30 that morning. That morning, I took our children to school and when I got home, I turned on the television set and the first building was on fire. And I immediately called Mary Pat at work, 
her office was two blocks from the World Trade Center. So I asked her what was going on. She said, well, they've told us just a commuter plane that flew into the building. We're fine, we're working. Don't worry about it, I'm at my desk, I'm working. While we continued to talk about our day, the second plane hit the second building. And she said to me, they're telling us we have to evacuate to the basement. I'll call you as soon as I can. On that day, Mary Pat and I had three children, eight, five, and one. And as the next five and a half hours passed, when I desperately tried to get back in touch with her and could not, there were three things that went through my head. One, what will I do if I've lost my best friend? Two, what am I going to tell our children? And three, am I really ready to be a single parent? Am I ready to raise these children on my own? In the intervening hours, the school called and told us that because so many children in our school had parents who worked in Lower Manhattan, that they had told the children about the attack and that we needed to be ready to speak to our kids when we picked them up from school. And when I was 10 minutes away from leaving to pick the children up from school, I got the single greatest phone call that I've ever gotten in my life. It was my wife on the other end of the phone from a pay phone in Midtown Manhattan where she had walked with wet t-shirts wrapped around her face and the face of her colleagues to get through the dust and the contaminants that were covering Lower Manhattan and she told me she was okay. That night she came home and one of our neighbors who she had helped to get a job in her industry after he had lost his, his wife called us and she said, did you see Frank? Did you see him anywhere downtown when you were leaving? Because he hasn't come home and I haven't heard from him. Mary Pat had helped him get a job at a place called Eurobrokers, which was on the 44th floor of the second World Trade Center tower. Frank never came home. And the gym in our parish, in our hometown, is now named in his honor. We sat at his funeral with his widow. Later that night, our oldest son's best friend, his mom called. Her husband worked for Cantor Fitzgerald. None of them who were there that day at work came home alive. That young man was eight years old at the time that his father died. And since Facebook has come into the popular being, every year on his father's birthday, he puts a picture of his father on his Facebook page with just one simple sentence. It says, Dad, we'll never forget you. We went to that funeral too. You see, what I'm worried about now is as a nation, we're forgetting his father. As a nation, we're forgetting Frank. As a nation, we have become complacent and soft and unwilling to do the difficult things that need to be done to do the first thing that any president of the United States must do when he takes his hand off that Bible on January 20th of 2017, and that is to protect the lives and the security of the American people, and that is exactly what I'll do when I take my hand off that Bible. And unlike others, on that first day, on January 21st, when the director of the FBI, Jim Comey, walks into the Oval Office to give me my national security briefing, we won't have to introduce ourselves to each other. When I was the U.S. Attorney for New Jersey, Jim Comey was the U.S. Attorney in Manhattan. And we worked together, jointly, on preventing terrorist attacks in America. And then he became my boss as the Deputy Attorney General of the United States. So when Jim sits there, he won't have to introduce himself. And when he sits there, he won't have to wonder whether I understand all the acronyms he's going to be using in his briefing. When we sit there together, he won't have to wonder whether I know 
what he means by actionable intelligence. When we're sitting there and he's briefing me, he will never wonder whether I have his back to do everything that needs to be done to prevent another attack because I've done it with him before and I will do it again as President of the United States. And while this is important, vital, absolutely vital, for the future safety and security of the American people, I'd suggest to you it's vital for the security and stability of the rest of the world as well. Because if you don't have a strong, resolute American president who says that terror anywhere is unacceptable, then our allies around the world can't count on us either. When I went to Israel in April of 2012 as governor of New Jersey, it was very soon after the death of Mrs. Netanyahu's father. And we turned out to be the first people that they received at their home for dinner after they had gone through their period of mourning. And when I sat with the Prime Minister that night, he obviously had grave concerns about what was going on in the Middle East and how it was going to affect the people that he sworn to protect. When we were leaving after a three-hour dinner that night talking about not only the world but about our children and their future, he thanked me for coming as he was leaving to go back to work. And as I walked out, I looked at him and I said, Mr. Prime Minister, I'll tell you one thing. If I ever do get the chance to become President of the United States, Israel will never have a better friend than me because I understand that America has no better friend in the Middle East or anywhere around the world than Israel. And that partnership has to be renewed. That partnership has to be restored. And it can only be renewed and restored through American strength of purpose. The Israeli government and the Israeli people need to know that when American president says he's going to do something, he will do it, regardless of where the polls are in any particular day. They need to understand that there is not a moral equivalency with the conflict in the Middle East. And they need to know that if Israel is threatened, that there will not be daylight between the United States and Israel and that the United States will stand up for Israel in the very same way that Israel has stood up for the United States during its time of existence as well. Now, it's only achieved if we are willing to rebuild our military. It's only achieved if we're willing to rebuild our intelligence community. It is only achieved if we are willing to support our law enforcement community. The stability of the world will not be achieved in any other way, everybody. That's the only way it will be achieved. And anyone who tells you any differently is absolutely playing with fire. I don't need to be taught these things. The last 13 years of my life have been about protecting the people of the state of New Jersey. And as a United States attorney, contributing to the protection of the people of our country in one of the most dangerous times our country has ever seen. Those times are now being repeated. And so let's be clear as we conclude, and then I'll take your questions. The ISIS, ISIS is not the JV, everybody. ISIS is a real, everyday threat to the lives and the security of the American people and people who love freedom all around the world. As President of the United States, not only my goal, but my accomplishment will be to make sure that ISIS is destroyed as both an ideology and a force around the world. And we'll work, unite the world together to do it. And lastly, the American people and the people around the world will know for certain that they have a president of the United States who says what he means and means what he says, and that there will be no ambiguity, no hand wringing in the Oval Office, no inability to make decisions, but an absolute willingness and commitment to stand up for what is right and what we believe in. And that means standing by our friends, fighting for them when necessary, and remembering that first and foremost, the safety and security of our children and our grandchildren 
is what the American government must do above anything else. And so I look forward to the opportunity to put together the team that will protect America once again and that will make the American people feel comfortable when they go to bed at night that they have a president who will put their country first and their safety and security above all else. I know that while the issues of the economy and education and technology are issues of concern to all of you, that you understand that if we don't have safety and security first, none of those other issues matter. I just want you to remember the week after September 11th, when airlines weren't flying, when sports weren't being played by professionals or by our children, when the stock market was closed, and when we all jerked our necks up to the sky every time a plane started to go overhead when those airplanes started to fly again. America cannot work unless America feels safe and secure. And when I'm President of the United States, they will feel safe and secure every night that they go to bed knowing that they have a strong, resolute leader making the decisions that put America's interests first and the interests of our friends first. Thank you for your time today. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Governor, welcome. Um, I got to tell you, though, uh, one of the things, you know, it, it, when we started planning this, I had this date circled on my calendar for a long, long time. Um, being from Philadelphia, I was all prepared to get up here and talk smack to you about my Eagles <laughs> and your Cowboys. <laughs> Little did I know they would both stink yes. the whole. <laughs> Awful. I can't even, in good conscience, talk smack no, to you, you right can't. now. No, you can't. No, you can't, Matt. I do want to pick up on, on what you talked about um, and uh, share with us, because there is a debate and there is this uh, conversation taking place within our party right now uh, about the balance between civil liberties and protecting uh, our own homeland and homeland security. Uh, tell me how you approach that and, and where do you see the balance uh, on those, you know, in, in terms of those issues? Matt, it's a false debate. It's a false debate. The idea that anything that was going on during the eight years of the Bush administration was either illegal or extra constitutional is absolutely false. L let's take one example. The program that ended this week, the NSA collection of metadata. You know, if you listen to the debate in Congress, what they'd have you believe is that we were listening into your phone calls with your wife and reading your emails with your children through the NSA metadata program. Let me tell you what they were doing. They were collecting numbers, numbers, millions of numbers. And if one number matched with a phone call to a number of a known terrorist, then it's our job to go to court to show probable cause to get that phone bill. And only until a judge signs off on that do you get the phone bill. Then, if you see further evidence in that phone bill that leads you to want to monitor that person, then you have to go back to court again under the Fourth Amendment and get a warrant to be able to tap those phones. What we've done by taking away that ability is to stop us from being able to connect the dots. You know, Senator Paul will come out here next and he'll say he wants more information from terrorists and less from innocent people. Here's my question. How do you know? I have to tell you, in my experience as a prosecutor, Terrorists don't wear sandwich boards saying, I'm a terrorist and I'm plotting to kill Americans. The way you find out is through the use of that data and the use under the Constitution protected by the Fourth Amendment. And that's what was done every day by U.S. attorneys, myself and others across the country. That's how we intervened and caught Hamet Lakani, who wanted to send sell shoulder-fired missiles to Yemeni terrorists to shoot commercial airliners out of the sky. That's how in New Jersey we stopped the attack on Fort Dix from six self-radicalized Americans in New Jersey who are obtaining weapons to attack and kill servicemen and women at Fort Dix. And without those tools, we would not have been able to do that. And so this is a false debate, Matt. This is the debate for theater. This is a debate to raise money. 
to cut their little speeches from Capitol Hill, put it on the internet, and then raise money by scaring people into thinking the government's listening to your phone calls or reading your emails. We never were. And when we, when we get sober and we reinstitute the NSA program, we won't be doing it then either. And under President Christie, that is exactly what we'll do. You think it'll take a tragedy in order for that to happen? The question was, do we think it'll take a tragedy for that to happen? The tragedy's already happened. Paris was an intelligence failure. You think these guys got together 15 minutes before the attack at a Taco Bell, right, and planned that attack? There were multiple folks involved living in multiple countries with specific planning, and we didn't catch them. We didn't catch them. The French didn't catch them. No one else in Western Europe caught them. And now we have San Bernardino. And what we know right now is this. No one knew that was coming. Now, we don't know what the depth of planning was on that, and we're going to learn more over the next number of days and weeks. But I think the tragedies have already occurred, Matt, and I think it's time for us to wake up. And every candidate who comes on this stage should be honest with you and tell you that we need to do these things, because if we don't do them, we are putting you and your families at risk. And that is the greatest failure that an American president can allow to happen on his or her watch. Uh, Jeff talked about it in his introduction, but I know many, many people in this room have seen uh, the video of your powerful remarks in the recent town hall meeting about losing your friend uh, to alcohol and substance abuse. Um, I used to work for Jack Kemp, who talked about compassionate conservatism. Uh, do you think we as a party have become too angry and have lost the compassion? No. I just don't think we talk about our compassion enough. We haven't lost it. The compassion's in the heart of every person that I know who works hard for this party. The compassion is there. We need to talk about it. Sometimes we're ashamed to talk about it. I I'm not. See, I'm pro-life. But I think, as a party, we should start talking a heck of a lot more about that period of time after that first nine months. See, it's easy to be pro-life when they're in the womb. They've done nothing to disappoint us yet. <laughs> when they come out, when they come out, it gets a lot more complicated, doesn't it? <laughs> See, I want to be pro-life for the 16-year-old, drug-addicted teenage girl on the floor of the county lockup. Her life is an individual gift from God. I want to be pro-life for the 42-year-old lawyer who got addicted to painkillers and alcohol and lost his law license, lost his family, lost his job, lost his home. His life is a precious gift from God. See, being pro-life is the most compassionate thing you can be, but we allow ourselves to be put into a box that the Democrats put us in to only talk about the nine months that that life is in the womb. We need to be talking about the entire life. I'm pro-life for the whole life, no matter what mistakes you've made, because I know these words are true, and I think most of you, if not all of you in this audience, believe them too. There, but for the grace of God, go I. And that's what we need to believe in. And that's the compassion that this party stands for. Well, to, to expand on that, do you think the, 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 the rhetoric we're seeing from some quarters, whether it's regarding Muslims, whether it's regarding Hispanics, immigrants, whatever, is, is ultimately caustic to, to our, our nation and to, the, to our party? Yeah, people need to be more careful when they're selecting their words. You bet. And sometimes the harshest words are the most entertaining. Sometimes the harshest words are the ones that make us laugh. Sometimes the harshest words are the ones that have us keep the television set on. But when you're a leader, you need to be blunt and direct, but you need to know where the line is. And I think, unfortunately, there have been some, not only in our party, but in the other party as well, who have gone for the entertainment value over being a leader. And I think we all need to be more sensitive to that. That's not political correctness. I, I've never been accused of that. <laughs> but, but it does mean, but it does mean that when I appointed a Muslim American judge to the bench in New Jersey, and I had people say to me that by doing that, he was gonna impose Sharia law 
on the people of New Jersey. A, a guy who immigrated here as a child, who worked his way through college and law school at night, whose entire life was about achieving the American dream and who now, after five years on the bench, is a distinguished and honored member of the bench, you need to stand up and say no to that. We need to judge people on their individual good and bad, not based on what they look like or where they came from. And so I think any time we use language that generalizes too much and is caustic in that way, Matt, we diminish ourselves as a people and as a party, and we need to be smart about that. Uh, obviously, uh, when you are uh, sworn in uh, in uh, 2017, uh, you will be faced with a number of challenges. Which do you see in, in the foreign policy world? Which do you see is the is the biggest challenge uh, facing uh, our nation? China, Russia, or radical Islam? And rank them, please. Sure. Um, first is radical Islam. And, and by the way, I would have used that term whether you use it or not. I don't know why Hillary Clinton won't use it. See, I think by being ambiguous, by using soft language there. We're not being respectful. We're making matters worse. See, radical Islam is not a criticism of Islam. It's a criticism of radicalism. But if you are unwilling to confront that, then you confuse the issue even more. So Mrs. Clinton's failure to be willing to say that, and the president's failure to say that, um, makes matters worse, not better, in terms of understanding with peaceful Muslims in this country and around the world. They're unsure of who we're talking about. When we say radical Islam, they know exactly who we're talking about. It's the number one threat because it threatens everyone. It threatens everyone. Number two is Russia. Because this president has allowed Vladimir Putin out of his cage and he needs to be put back in. He, in fact, unlocked the cage and invited him into Syria. Instead of settling those matters himself with American leadership, he invited Russia in to negotiate a settlement with a butcher in Damascus who has killed nearly a quarter of a million of his own people. And the idea that Russia gives a lick about ISIS is laughable. How many of their people, nearly 240, were murdered in cold blood by ISIS? Have you seen one attack by Russia on ISIS yet? One. No. Nope who they're bombing are the moderates, the rebels in Syria, because they want to prop up Assad and have a client state with Iran in Syria. And so they are a threat, not because they're strong enough to defeat us, but because every day we're allowing Vladimir Putin to punch above weight, because we have a weak and feckless president who is unwilling to confront anyone other than Bibi Netanyahu. And third is China, because that relationship can go one way or another, and it's going to depend upon the strength and the clarity of the next American president. That could become a fruitful, respectful relationship where we benefit from an understanding with China that this is not a zero-sum game and that we can all do well in this world, economically and otherwise. Or we could continue to be weak and allow China to attack us through cyber warfare and not respond allow China to steal our intellectual property and not respond, allow China to build artificial islands in the South China Sea and try to dominate those shipping lanes and not respond. If we continue to show weakness, China will take. If we show strength, China will cooperate. And so I have much more hope about our relationship with China than I do about the first two. So that's why I order them in that order. Great. Well, our time is up. Thank you so much, Governor. Thank you very much.